Hello. It's um, it's Sunday, two o'clock, and here we are. <clears throat> I think I need a drink of water right off the bat. My name is Suzanne Bryan, and this is a live stream, and so that means you can participate. You can ask questions. There's a chat. Uh, over to the side, I think for some people it might be on the bottom. Feel free to ask questions. If you do want to, please preface it with the word QUESTION in all caps. That makes it easier for me to find when I scroll down the um, chat. By the way, I'm using a different type of a microphone. I want to know if you hear me okay. I can't tell because I hear me just fine. So let me know if the, what the quality of the sound is, whether I need to turn it up or down. I'm hoping that it's just about the same. Okay, good. Thank you, Margot. So everybody's on here. I do like to read everybody's names, but um, it might be getting a bit much. So let me go back up to the top here. There were some questions people asked right away. And also, I have uh, some swatches to share. I have some knitting needles to share. I have a book to share, plus just the general chit chat. So let's see. Siobhan Gleesh asked, what is the name of the Rolls Royce needles you use for sweaters, please? Let me show you. They are called Diacraft. It's D-Y-A-K-C-R-A-F-T. It's a mom and pop business, and it's not a big production company. They make these needles. These are my orange and black ones. The finish on them is unbelievable. They have a really nice, uh, the, the conical part is more curved. It's just a little bit different. The texture of these is just, they're just like knitting with butter. So I have the orange and black ones. And then I have dark blue and light blue. And what's cool about these, you can get them in any length. They can custom, I get mine five inch. I like five inch needles. The reason I like five inch needles is because when I knit, I hold the needle in all of my fingers. So I like the needle to be able to extend from one side of my hand to the other side of my hand. Some people like uh, shorter needles, but they might have a smaller hand. I don't have particularly big hands. I, I have really long fingers because I'm tall and, and thin, but I like the needle to extend out both sides of my hand. That way I can get leverage. I can leverage between my little finger and my first finger. I can leverage the needles. Um, so, and this company, um, the husband is the one that makes the needles and the wife makes the needle cases. Now, these are not the Diacraft needle cases. These are Haya Haya. Uh, I happen to like the Haya Haya needle cases and I have a ton of Haya Haya needles too. So I kind of bunch all my needles up into the Haya Haya cases. But when you go on the Diacraft website and you order the needles, they do come in sets like what I have, but you can also call them up and the lady, Mrs. Dyack, answers the phone. And so let's say you're ordering a set, and, and I don't know how many needles you get in a set. Let's say you get six different sizes, two needles of six different sizes. You can choose whichever sizes you want, or you can have them all the same. So, uh, usually I will buy, like, I'll get four tips that are the same. I like to have, because I use the same needle sizes over and over and over. I like size a one up through about five. Five is about as large as I go for sweaters and I use ones for socks. So I use two, three, four, five, mostly twos, threes, and fours for sweaters because I use fingering weight yarn. So I'll order a bunch of tips of all the same size and get their discount for a pack because those are the sizes that I use all the time. There's no point in me ordering sizes that I don't use just because they come in the pack. And I really like that, that they custom make your pack for you. You can even mix the colors if you want. And they have lots of different colors. The first ones they made, and they have plain steel ones too, but these are, they're anodized. They're anodized. 
The first ones they made were the light blue. And so I got those and then they made the dark, the dark purple. And I just, I loved those. And then they came out with the orange. And of course I had to have those. And so, you know, that's how it goes. So those are the needles. Okay. I love them. Okay. This is Siobhan again. Would it be possible to show on video how to cast on and knit the corrugated ribbing with two circulars? I think I have a video of that. I have, um, I think, I don't know. I'll have to look and see, and I can't do that right now. Let me write that down in my bullet journal. Is anybody else using a bullet journal? I love my bullet journal. Helps me so much. So I'll do that later today. So check, check on video, two needle, one by one corrugated ribbing. Now I know, I know, I, I absolutely have one on two by two corrugated ribbing with two needles, but I'll check with that on the one by one corrugated needle. Okay, everybody's getting snow. We've been getting a ton of rain. Um, up in our mountains, we've gotten way more snow than we usually get, which we usually get very little. So it's kind of cool. Okay, this is Mary Inman. Question, for I tag yoke, what fibers would be suggested if we plan to steak? This is a great question. And she says, assume super wash would not work. Super wash will work. What you don't want are slippery fibers like uh, bamboo, tinsel, silk, rayon, um, like that. So anything that has wool in it will work whether it's super wash or not. I've never steaked alpaca, so I, I can't give you my personal experience on that. It might be too slippery. Now, when I show you how to steak, I use a method for securing the steak before you cut it that works pretty good for most fibers. And if worse comes to worse, you can reinforce your steak with the sewing machine, which is okay. Okay, I've done that too, okay? Let's see. Hello, everybody. It's so fun to see everybody on here. Okay, this is Adriana. She says, working on an eye tag cardigan, laid it over my shoulders, and it sits right up against my neck, unlike yours before the short rows and collar. You don't want to omit, omit the short rows. The short rows aren't made to bring it in this way. The short rows are made to bring it up this way so that when the other part comes over, it folds down and lays down like this. Don't omit the short rows. They're not meant to fill in this area. They're meant to bring the back of the shawl collar up so it lays against this part of your neck here. Okay. And let's see. This is Delise. Question, what features make diacraft cirques better than Haya Haya Sharps and Chow Gu cirques? Um, it's, the, it's the material, it's that um, coating they put on them, and the points are completely different. They're not quite as sharp as the Haya Haya Sharps or the Chow Gu um, lace, but they are very, very nice. They often have some that are seconds, so that if you can buy seconds, if you just want to buy one tip, you know, two tips, one needle, and a cable, you could do that and try them out. So just go to their website. They usually have some seconds that you can get. And see. They also are very popular for their wooden needles. I'm not a wooden needle user, but if you like wooden needles, their wooden needles evidently are to die for, but I've never tried them. Okay. Whoops, big jump up. <laughs> oh, thank you, Claire. Claire says she loves my new hairdo. I got a different haircut yesterday. You know, I have naturally curly hair, but it's not curly enough to make it really pretty. So I really have to coach it, coax it into a curl. And I got tired of that. So now I'm using the flat iron to get out the curl. Okay. And Susan McBride says she loves my sweater. I'll talk about this sweater in a minute. Okay, let me go down here. And if I miss your question, be sure to repost it because I'll come back and get it, okay? Okay, Kathy Mashburn. Question, I tag cardigan. I have 45 stitches on the sleeve and need to start the ribbing, which should have 40 stitches. How do I get from 45 to 40 stitches on the ribbing? On the, last, the first row 
of your ribbing? That's a great question, Kathy. On the very first row of the ribbing, I'm assuming you probably do knit two, purl two ribbing or knit one, purl one ribbing. On the very first row, you're going to decrease those five stitches evenly distributed around. And I would do them in a purl stitch. So you purl two together, evenly distributed. I would do that five times and then you'll have your 40 stitches and it'll be perfect. This is Melanie. She says, question, a pic of the yoke sweater. Well, I don't have a picture of the yoke sweater yet. I'm working on mine. Um, I hope to have the yoke portion finished by the 15th. But I wore this um, to show you what the possibilities are. This is one of the very first, if not the first, maybe it's the second sweater that I knit where I made up the design myself. I just started and I really knew nothing about knitting. In fact, when I knitted this sweater, the only decrease I knew was knit two together. And the only increase I knew was knit front and back. So on the sleeves where I made the increases, um, like here's a knit front and back right on the outside of the sleeve, right? Cause I didn't know that you should put them along the seam line. I didn't even know there was supposed to be a seam line. I just put them in. There's there's some out up here on the shoulder where I just made a, a knit front and back. There's one right there. I needed to make an increase to make it fit. So I just did, and it has some short rows across the back and I did the same thing. I just did the short, I just turned. I didn't even make a wrap and turn cause I, I knew nothing about that. So and it still turned out okay. Plus it's 100% silk, which has no body whatsoever. And it stretches and stretches and stretches and gets bigger and bigger. It's, it's raw silk, so it's kind of coarse. Um, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I just throw it in the washer and dryer and it shrinks back up again. And then I wear it for a while. I made this probably in 1990 or 91. I wear it um, periodically. Sometimes I forget that I own it and I don't wear it for a while. But this is just, uh, I called it my starburst sweater or sunburst because, see, I just did in patterns of, knit to, I did knit and purl, I did ribbing, and then the ribbing gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier as it goes up to here until it turns into knit one purl one ribbing. So I was still engineering at that time, engineering it with yarn, but I didn't know what I was doing, but it's still, and see how the, the this is way too big, but that's because the silk stretches out so much. So this is kind of my preview of the yoke sweater, all that I have at the moment. Deborah Gassity, what's a bullet journal? A bullet journal is an empty book. It's like a giant to-do list, only you organize your to-do list. It's so cool. Oh, my God. And, and I have a friend who's been doing a bullet journal for a long time. And she kept telling me, Suzanne, you need to do the bullet journal. And I'm like, you know, I have my own to-do list. I've always had to-do lists. That's how I get things done. But um, I was starting to, I'm, I've been working on my anxiety level lately. I've been doing some acupuncture and other things, trying to uh, suppress my anxiety level, which I've had my whole life. It's not anything new. It's just as I'm getting older, I don't like it as, I can't tolerate it as much as I used to. Um, but so I started this bullet journal and what's so cool about it, it really does relieve my anxiety, believe it or not, because remember how I used to tell you all I'd say, remind me, remind me on Tuesday. If you don't hear from me, tell me to do that again. I don't have to do that anymore because I just write it down in my book. I sign it a day. And if I don't get it done on that day, guess what? I just move it to another day. It's so cool. And it's taken care of and it takes the guilt off my shoulders. So I really, really like that. That's what a bullet journal is. You can go to www.bulletjournal.com. The guy that invented it has a little five minute video, which is perfect for people like me who don't want to spend 20 minutes watching a video. And I'm sorry I make some of my videos long like that. You probably feel the same way. But watch that little video. It explains it. Okay. Siobhan, question. You do not... You do not have a cast on with two needles. Okay, question. You do not. Okay, so I'll look. I'll make one for you. Okay, Siobhan, I'll add that to my video to-do list. Thank you for looking it up. It saves me that task. I appreciate it. So I have in my bullet journal, these are all the videos that I want to make. Can you see that? I'm going to add it to my list. Okay, corrugated ribbon. Oh, that's right. I have it flat, don't I? 
That's right. I have that one video on working it flat. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. That's what friends are for. Okay. Question. Claudio. Is it Dyer? Diacraft? D Y A K C R A F T. Okay. Claire question. Claire Claire Christian asked, do bullet journals when you're work when you're napping? Yes, because when you're napping, you're not trying to remember all those things that you forget. You nap better. Yes, great question. Okay. Grammy Lulu question. I have never made a sweater. Do you have a recommendation for a first project? Very nervous, so thinking of knitting a child size first. I can't recommend any particular project. I would just jump in, find something you like, and a child size is excellent. Um, I know I, I wouldn't even know where to start uh, in this day and age. I would look at pictures on Ravelry. I would look for things that say that they're easy and um, start there and look at people's comments on their projects and see what they had to say about it. Okay, so I have a couple questions from people on Ravelry. The first one is from Ibuubu, and she lives quite a distance from a local yarn store. There's nothing near her, and she's really concerned about how to pick yarn when you can't personally see it. And that's a big uh, issue, and I used to have that problem myself too. The first thing is with Ravelry, Ravelry is like amazing. Ravelry is the best thing that has happened to knitting in our lifetime, literally. Go to Ravelry, look under yarn, pick the yarn you want to look at, or pick any yarn and look at it. Go to the yarns page, and then you'll get the basic information. But then look at where people have made projects with it and where people have stashed it. It'll be over on the right-hand side of your screen. Go there because oftentimes people post really, really good pictures of their yarn and you can see up close and you can actually see what the twist looks like. Also, you can go to people's projects and you can look and see what they said. They may even talk about the yarn and give you some ideas about the yarn. Um, outside of that, I think the best thing you can do, what worked for me was the first time I ever went to a yarn convention like stitches or any type of fiber craft fair where they're going to have a lot of yarn. Even if you have to go a distance, like when I go to stitches, it's quite a ways for me. It's like 200 and some miles from my house. So the first time I ever saw yarn in the wild was at stitches and I went and it's okay to touch the yarn. And I went around and I touched all the yarn and I looked at it and you analyze it. And pretty soon you figure out there are only a few yarn bases. There might be like 20 or 30. I might be totally off, but in my opinion, there's probably even less than that yarn bases for bases, B-A-S-E-S. -E That's what the underlying yarn is before it's dyed. Um, look at them and pretty soon you'll start seeing all these companies are really selling the same yarn base. It's just how it's dyed. Um, so once you start figuring that out, um, it makes life a lot easier as far as picking yarn. Uh, that opened my eyes. And if you get the opportunity to do that, I would do that. You'll learn a lot about yarn. Touch it, feel it, take the skein. I untwist the fibers. You know, when I'm looking at the yarn, I don't just look at the skein. I actually go up and I grab a part of it and I untwist it. And I look at the individual fibers and I examine the twist. When I, in the beginning of going and looking at yarn, I would just pick something because I liked the color. I had no idea uh, about the makeup or anything like that. Okay, Delise has a question. She says, I have a bullet journal in my device. I can plot photos at two, but I too. Moving a task from Tuesdays to Wednesday, um, it's similar. That's that's not the same because that's what I did too. I used my calendar, my online calendar extensively as a to-do list and I would move things from day to day. 
Um, this is, I don't, psychologically, it's different. You're going to have to research it yourself and see what you think about it. Yes, David Hensley. Thank you, David. Dolis, there's something about the physical motion of writing that helps with memory and release of what you're writing. It's the release. It's once you've written it down, it's out of your mind, and you don't have to try to think about it anymore because you know it's in the book. I, I wrote it on my calendar religiously. I've kept calendars for years and years and massive to-do lists. This is, I don't know why it's different, but it's huge. And I noticed it within the first couple of days of using it. So that was pretty awesome. I can't recommend it enough, but I know it's not for everybody. So if you're an attention deficit disorder person or high anxiety person, I think that it will help you. Speaking of anxiety, years ago, um, and this doesn't have any, it has to do with knitting. I guess it has to do with knitting. Um, when I was working, I was working, uh, one of my colleagues was a very, very distinguished oncologist. And I worked in oncology uh, for quite a few years. And I was really stressed out one day. My, my, a lot of things were going on in my life. And I told him, I said, I am so stressed out. I need to get rid of some of my stress. And he said, Suzanne, everyone functions best at their stress level, whatever it may be. My stress level needs to be high for me to function at my best. And that is true because if I remove the stresses, guess what? I just collapse and I do nothing. Literally, I do nothing. But if I have that stress, and that's why I make all these projects and do all these crazy things, is because that's where I function best and I feel best and I'm happiest. So he said, if you get rid of a stress, you'll just replace it with another stress. And I've found that to be very, very true. So it's not about getting rid of your stress. It's more about managing your stress. So, okay. This is from Eileen. She says, questions. Hi from Virginia. I am knitting a cardigan in an Aran weight. Do you have suggestion for a sturdy buttonhole method? Um, it depends on what your uh, button band is going to look like and what kind of stitches you have in your button band. Eileen, I have several videos um, in my video list and I'll link, I'll try to link them down below after this. Um, I'll be reminded, I have a reminder and uh, I'll link them. I have videos on buttonholes in different types of stitch patterns. So you can look at them and see which ones you like. And I always swatch mine anyway. So Su Fuji question. I was looking all over the place on Ravelry yesterday so I could ask you a question. Could you tell me where to go? Go to my group on Ravelry. It's called Knitting with Suzanne Bryan. And then there's a thread and it's called, um, questions for live stream or something like that. And that's where you ask your question. Also down below this video, it takes, um, um, Diana Danko is my timestamp person for my live videos. Thank you, Diana. She helps me so much. It takes a, about a day from when she gets the timestamps made, then she sends them to me. And then I put them in the video down below this video is the written information, you know, and you might have to click on something. You can't look at it during the live stream, but when the live stream is over, you can go down and I put all the information. There's the timestamps with all the topics. And when she comes to the part where I mentioned buttonholes, I'll plug in the videos and then you can just click on them and it'll go right to those buttonhole videos. Okay. And we do that every time. And, uh, and Sue, I'll put, there. there's a link down there to my Ravelry group. All you have to do is click on it. It takes you right to my Ravelry group. Carol Brasino, question. Do you have a fix for a hole created by stitch breaking and unraveling? The hole is in the center front of my Lopi yarn pullover. Duplicate stitch. Um, you might have to duplicate stitch several stitches. And um, it, that's usually pretty invisible. If the hole is more than one row, it's a little bit more difficult, but it can still be done. You just, you're going to duplicate stitch over a couple of rows. What a bummer. Don't you hate that? Okay, Linda Foster. When blocking, do block your pieces before you join them together, then block again when you finish your garment. I block all the pieces before I join them because seaming is way easier and a lot neater if you block the pieces first. 
then I do not reblock the whole garment. I might steam the seams or uh, um, you can put a um, damp towel over them and just let them sit there till it's dry and it'll block them. Susan Powell says, will the yoke sweater be top down or bottom up? It's going to be top down, but it would be easily convertible to bottom up. You know, it's a yoke sweater, top down, bottom up. The only difference is if you're doing top down, you're making increases. If you're doing bottom up, you're making decreases. That's the only difference. Really easy. Okay. Hello, Kathy. Jennifer Huish, question. When you are knitting a sweater in the round, do you add stitches to do mock seams to give the garment structure? Mock seams do not give the garment structure. They just give a decorative line. Um, sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. Um, Elizabeth Zimmerman had a way of she would actually drop a whole column on the side. She wouldn't do a mock seam. She would just drop a whole column of stitches and then she would pick them back up two at a time so it's like every other one is slipped. That's what it kind of looks like, a slip stitch seam. And that would create a little extra structure. But the standard mock seam does not add structure to your garment. Good question. Okay. Now, Dolice says she's had a spit splice come apart. Dolice, um, if you do the spit splice at least two inches, overlapping at least two inches, the splicing part, it should not come undone unless you're using really big yarn and each stitch takes two inches. Um, but once the yarn has gone through two stitches and two inches of splicing should give you uh, more than two in uh, stitches, it should give you three or four stitches. If you're working with, um, you know, like DK or fingering weight yarn, you might have to do three inches if you're working with worsted weight, but it really needs to go through at least three stitches, and that's the same as duplicate stitch. It's the exact same thing as duplicate stitch is spit splicing. So it shouldn't come apart, especially if you uh, block it, steam block it after you make it or wet block it. Okay. So Melanie, um, she wants to buy her yarn. You need to figure out what weight yarn you want to use. We're going to use this book as our guide. It's not the pattern, just the guide. But if you know what weight yarn you're going to use, how many stitches you're getting to the inch, and the bust circumference you want, you can get a ballpark uh, calculation from this book about how much yarn you need. Okay, so you can get your yarn. I would always get a skein extra because I'll tell you, you're going to be swatching and you need that yarn for swatching. You don't want to be feeling like, oh my God, am I going to run out of yarn because I'm swatching. I always get an extra skein just for swatching. Okay. So Jennifer, she says, I made her leggings. Yes, the leggings are awesome, aren't they? Okay, so um, there's some more questions here from Ravelry. This is from Will Knit for Donuts. She says, hi, Suzanne, I brought my honeycomb cables all the way down into three inches of brioche ribbing. If I use the Italian bind off to bind off the brioche stitches, should I do the cable parts? She wants to know how to bind off. And here's a picture of her, brio her cable coming down into the brioche. Isn't that pretty? Um, you know, I would just use the standard bind off. I think that it's um, stronger for the bottom of a sweater. So you could just use a standard uh, bind off in pattern. So during the brioche part, you would bind off a knit stitch, a purl stitch, knit stitch, purl stitch. Then when you come to the ribbing section, bind off, I mean, in your cable section, bind off in your cable pattern. Okay. Okay. Helen Henry, I looked for info on your upcoming class series in Bakersfield, but could not find it. When is the classes going to start? Thanks. I haven't got them scheduled yet. We just finished week four of the current 10 week session. And um, I don't have the next one scheduled yet. So I can't give you that information. Um, you can go, you can always look at the website for the Twisted Skein. That's the yarn store where I teach and they will have upcoming classes there when they get scheduled. I may not even think about scheduling them until we're close to this 10 weeks being done. Dolice asks, extra skein, 100 grams or fi not 50 grams. Exactly, you want 100 grams extra wool to work swatches. 
Stephanie, question, why do people rewind hanks? It depends on how your yarn comes. If your yarn comes in a skein, you can't really knit from that. If you open the skein up, there's nothing holding it together and it'll just turn into a big tangled mess. But if you're knitting from a ball that already comes in a ball shape that's already been wound, you can knit right from that. You don't need to rewind it. Um, so it's just, you know, that's how you do it. Melanie says, question, question, how many colors in the yoke sweater? It depends on what you want to do. So for example, in this yoke sweater, there's just one yarn. It's a multicolored yarn. So just one yarn. But if you want to put a design element other than a uh, textured like this, if you want to put a colored design element in, you'll need some extra yarn for that and probably no more than 50 grams of any weight of yarn. But oftentimes you have to buy 100 grams. So if you have yarn in your stash that's a different color, that's okay. We can do stranded in here. You can do mosaic. You can do a slip stitch design. You can do a cable. You can do lace. You can do a combination of any of those. And I'm going to show you how to figure it out and how to make it fit into the yoke. It's really kind of cool. Grammy Lulu, question. I bought some Haya High needles after your podcast last week. Cables are very tight and coiled up. Do you recommend steaming? Now, did you buy them from Haya Haya or a yarn store, or did you buy them from Amazon? And I have had a couple other people who say when they buy them from Amazon that the cables are stiff, and I think they're getting really, really old needles that someone else is reselling. Uh, all of the Haya High needles that I've bought directly from Haya Haya USA or uh, from a yarn store, the cables have been soft. But in any event, yes, you can steam the cables. I lay them out, I pull them straight, and I pin them down so they can't move. And I take my fabric steamer and I steam them and get all the kinks out. Oh, Kathy says she soaks hers in hot water. That would probably work really good too. Pamela Matthews says she tends to rewind all purchased yarn just in case there's a knot or other flaw. I'd rather find it early on instead of deep in the project. And Grammy says, yes, she bought it from Amazon. I'm sorry. I should have said, don't buy Haya Haya needles from Amazon. I don't know why. I wouldn't buy any needle knitting needles from Amazon. I would buy them from the manufacturer or a known yarn store. Okay. Melanie says, question. Hi, Suzanne. I love the hair. I'm having a hard time adapting the alternate pattern to the starry, starry, nice gusset pattern. Even if, oh, Melanie, okay. Even if I put 29, 39 on the instep and 41 on the gusset needle, the edge colors won't match up. Just rearrange your stitches so that the edge color matches up. So if you need to have a dark color as the first stitch, rearrange it so the dark color is the first stitch. That's all you need to do. Okay. Julie, question. Will we be able to use your fabulous pocket design in this iTag yoke sweater? Um, you could. Um, if you want to make a cardigan, yes, because my pockets really are suitable for a cardigan. And in this yoke sweater, you can do a cardigan or a pullover. So I will continue adding the pocket directions. Yes, that's a great question. And thank you for asking it. Mary Inman says she uses a hairdryer to straighten out her. That's another good option for straightening out her, her uh, kinky uh, um, knitting needle cables. Okay, this is from Demetria. She said, Suzanne, in your experience, should I be concerned about finishing a lace shawl with a yarn of a different fiber content than the one I started with? This is a great question. So here's her picture. She has a lot of her shawl done, and she doesn't have any more of that yarn, but she has a similar yarn in a similar color, but a different fiber. I think it would look outstanding. I have seen a lot of shawls that change texture or fiber or slight variation of the same color or from one fiber to another fiber and that fiber again. If you have enough of your base fiber left, it'd be really cool to do a few rows in this, then a few rows in this, and then if you go back to this and do the rest in this. So it kind of gives you, instead of a drastic change, it gives you a subtle change. But yes, I think that would be absolutely lovely. Okay, so let's see, that's all. Oh, I have one more question here. This is from Kylady, 
And she says, at your request, I'm moving my question into this thread. Sorry for the late post. My mother-in-law has asked for a hooded scarf without the pointed tip. And she wants to know if she can add my hood to her scarf. Yes, you can. And I just sent the final, final, yay! I tag directions to Francoise to be translated into French. And she'll probably get them back to me tomorrow. And then I will post them on Ravelry. And so I have um, three different ways to do the hood. One is, here's my little short rope prototype. Isn't that cute? So on the short rope, and the white is the sweater, okay? Uh, if you had a cable going up the back of your sweater on the short row hood, you would be able to carry that cable up over the back of the hood and all the way down to the front here and blend it into your ribbing. On the standard hood that comes straight up and that you graft at the top, you cannot bring this up the back. It wouldn't look good. It would just end right at the top of your head and wouldn't look particularly good. But you can bring the cable from the fronts up and around and over the top of the hood. So on that hood, I have two versions. And one is where you just come straight up the back so it'd be pointy like this. And then you graft here. And the other one I added short rows just into this section right here. So it gives you a curved look on the back. And I have directions for measuring your head and figuring out how big your hood needs to be and how to figure out your stitch count and all that kind of stuff. So you can use it with any weight of yarn and any stitch count. Cool. So you can add that to a shawl too if you want to. Okay. Steve Keel, do you like crocheting or no? I like crocheting. I like crocheting. I just like knitting better. I'm very good at crocheting, but I like knitting better. I'm kind of stuck on knitting. Okay. So let's see what else I have to share, okay? I have this book. I actually have two books to share with you today. This book I wanted to share. This is by Margaret Radcliffe. She's an excellent knitter. And I thought that for those of you doing the yoke sweater, you might want to look at this book because it has all different types of color work in it. And it's really good. It's a good book. I've used this for a reference a lot of times. Any of these types of color work in here and she's very good. Oh, look, at here's the intarsia. She tells you how to start with the strand on the front of the work. You will not see that very often. And that's this is exactly where I learned how to do that, how to start. When you start a new strand, you start with it hanging on the front of the work. Do you see that? And there's a reason why. That's because you often get a hole right there. If you start with your strand on the back, the beginning of the strand on the back of the work, it doesn't get joined right there and you get a hole. Also, with that strand hanging on the back with all the other strands, it can get really confusing about which strand you're supposed to be using next. So if the new tails, every time she started with a new color, see they're on the front of the work. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a big tip. The whole book is worth it just for that one tip. But it's a great book on all the different types of color work. It's called Color Knitting Techniques, The Essential Guide to Color Knitting Techniques by Margaret Radcliffe. Okay. Let's see what page I have marked in here. It might be the intarsia page. Oh, no. It's on a mosaic pattern. Very cool. Okay. That's one book. The other one I wanted to show you, this book is where I learned uh, a lot about garment construction. And in this book, she just does set in sleeves, but the concepts are the same. And what this is Jean Frost, and it's called Custom Fit Knit Jackets. Now, I don't particularly care for any of the patterns of the jackets in here, but what I got from this book is if you sew, and I'm a sewer, it makes you, you can relate knitting with sewing. So she uses schematics. And remember, uh, Anne, schematic is the king, right? 
the schematic. And she teaches you how to, what the standard body measurements are. And what you do is you go through here and you measure your body and you circle your measurements. And you'll find out that you probably don't fall in one line of standard body measurements. You probably go back and forth between sizes. And then she shows you how to alter the individual parts of the patterns to fit your size. This is so eye-opening for me on sizing. Now, this is not for people who write patterns. I'm not talking about that kind of sizing. I'm talking about the kind of sizing to make something fit yourself, okay? This is a must-have in your library if you're one of those people that needs to alter patterns to make them fit you. If you are the lucky person that never has to change a pattern, you don't need that book. Okay, down here, Katie Brown, question. Can you show us how we can modify your cardigan pocket design into a card kangaroo pocket? I can. I'll do that in the iTag yoke. You can make a kangaroo pocket very easily from my pocket. Yes, good question. And this is from Champ Smith. Question, is the yoke pattern still going out on February 15th? Yes, on February 15th, it'll be half price. It'll be $12.50. And after that, it'll be $25. Okay, it'll be that way for 24 hours on February 15th. I'll give you plenty of ad advanced notice. Be sure to subscribe to my Facebook group, not subscribe. Join my Facebook group because that's where I make announcements. It's called Knitting with Suzanne Bryant. Also on Ravelry, Knitting with Suzanne Bryant. Just join those groups on this YouTube channel. Subscribe to my videos and hit the bell so that you will get notifications when I send out new videos. Speaking of the bell, I've started um, getting these videos uh, uploaded or getting the notification uploaded earlier and earlier. So when you get it, you can get on there and then you can, there's a little bell on that you can hit that it reminds you right before the video comes on. So you get a little reminder from YouTube. Okay. Yes, Valerie Dunham says that second book would be great as I was to learn because you can do use it for sewing and fitting that same book. I'm sewing and knitting. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see. Other things that I wanted to share. I have some swatches out here. This is the swatch that I made for one of my videos. And this is the one about perfect picked up button bands. So um, the, what makes it perfect is that it goes straight across the top. Can you see that? It doesn't divot down and it doesn't divot up here. And if you look at a lot of sweaters, on Ravelry, pictures of sweaters. On the bottom here, it goes like this, up right here. And on the top, it comes down. And I show in, in my iTag cardigan, I told you how to not do that. And this is one of the videos that's linked to that. So this is uh, the same size as this blue swatch is the same height, okay? These are exact same number of rows, these two blue swatches. This one has, this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one has one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This one has a few more stitches picked up along the edge than this one. Can you see what it does? I think it's got like maybe four more stitches or something. Not very much. I don't remember exactly, but it's not very much. And do you see what it does? So this is where I picked up in every stitch, in every row. I picked up in every row. I went along the front and just picked up a new stitch in every row without any regards to a ratio. On this one, I used my ratio between my ribbing stitch gauge and my stockinette row gauge. And so it came out perfect. On this side over here, I picked up every other row. And obviously that doesn't work either. So it's the ratio. Now, if you pick up every other row, what's the same? What's that the same as? How many of you been, have been taught on the edge of your fabric to slip the first stitch of the row? Hmm? 
a lot of people. If you slip the first stitch of the row along an edge where you're gonna pick up stitches or seam or anything like that, it allows you to only pick up every other row because you slipped those stitches. This is what it would look like. This is the same thing as picking up a stitch every other row. I do not slip the stitch at the beginning of a row where I'm going to be seaming or picking up stitches because I need to see those rows. I don't want them just, you know, distorted by slipping. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Then I just have some swatches. This one is, you know, I told you I make big swatches. This is a swatch I knit for a sweater, and I was trying out different needle sizes here. Um, this is another swatch for a sweater. This is how big I make them, you see, because you have to have a swatch big enough that you can see what the fabric is like. If you make a little, if you make your swatch this size, you can't tell what the fabric's like. So I make, then this is a really fine yarn. See, it's really small yarn. I made a big swatch. This is a swatch I made trying different effects for a sock heel, for a heel flap in color work. So I just kept going. Uh, this is my swatches before I make us like if I probably used this for a sock pattern that I was making. And so I was just testing out the effects of different techniques for a heel in two colors. This is another swatch. This was for a pillow actually. And this is how big I made the swatch because I wanted it to fit a 14 by 14. So I needed to be able to get an accurate stitch gauge. Here's another one. This is in fingering weight yarn and this is linen stitch. Great big giant swatch. Here's lace for a top. Speaking of, I'm gonna show you how to measure in a stitch pattern gauge today. This isn't a swatch, this is a wristlet. It goes like this. And it's a class that I teach on how to do fair isle knitting with a steak. And I have this all written up and for the people who buy the pattern for the iTag yoke, I'm going to send this out. You'll get this at the very beginning of the pattern as a little bonus. So you can try fair isle knitting. You, you know, this has multiple colors and you could do it with two colors. You don't need all these colors. You could do the same thing with two colors. And if you don't, it could be a cup cozy, you know, it could go around your cup, you know, something like that, whatever you want. But it gives you an opportunity to make steaks and to cut them and to practice the steak techniques, okay? These are some of the swatches that I made for the eye tag sweater. And see, they're still really good size. And that takes a lot of yarn to do that. And I don't rip my swatches out, I keep them. So this is why you need to buy an extra 100 grams. See how big all these swatches are? 100 grams of yarn if you're gonna knit a sweater that fits. See, this is really big. This is just plain stuck in it. And I label them. I put the, the needle I used and um, the size of the needle and the yarn. Now, um, Speaking of swatches, you cannot reuse a swatch. Like let's say I knit it, I did knit this into a cardigan, okay? I knitted this several years ago for my daughter. And let's say I'm gonna knit with this yarn again, maybe a different color. And I go, oh, well I used a size five needle on that and that worked pretty good. I just used the information from this swatch. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. Because first of all, time has elapsed and you may be knitting with a different gauge. Your gauge changes from day to day, from time to time, from stress to non-stress, glass of wine, no glass of wine, beer, no beer, you know, um, the time of the day. But it especially changes over time. So I cannot use this swatch a second time, but I still keep my swatches because every swatch reminds me of the project I did. Here's a little swatch I did on Intarsia. My little intarsia swatch, isn't that cute? Speaking of um, measuring stitch gauge, so that was one of the questions somebody asked on Ravelry. This is a good example of measuring stitch gauge. 
Okay, so I don't remember what the exact stitch gauge is from the, for the repeat, but let's say it's 10 stitches. And this could be a cable, it could be lace, it could be anything where there's a pattern repeat. Okay, it could be ribbing. I'm looking for something here that might be better representational, but this is it. So let's say that's 10 stitches. Then you would use your ruler and you would measure over, you know, maybe uh, even repeats. So I can say I can get two full repeats here. So I would measure from the same point on this repeat to the same point over here, measure that. And then I know that's 20 stitches. And then I can figure out how many stitches I'm getting per inch in this repeat. I do not need to have to count every little stitch because on a design like this, sometimes it can be confusing, especially on a design like, um, where's the lace? This lace. Okay. So there's two full repeats here. Can you see it's like a V? The Vs. There's two full repeats. There's no edge stitches on this, but let's... And if you do edge stitches, don't do them in garter stitch or seed stitch because it'll change your row gauge. Um, just do them in stockinette or do more of your same stitch pattern. But here we have two multiples of this. Let's say this was 16 stitches in a multiple. I don't need to count every stitch because that's really hard to do on a lace pattern. All I need to know is from point A to point B is 16 stitches. And from point A to point B is 16 stitches. So this would be 32 stitches wide. Measure it with my ruler, but I need those edge stitches. They're not there. I don't want you to think you can just measure from the edge of the fabric. Pretend there's more fabric out here, okay? Or if we turn it this way, we could measure one repeat from here to here. Can you see that? That way you have some fabric out here. So let's say that's 16 stitches. You measure that, and then you know how many stitches you're getting to the inch for that stitch pattern. It's very easy to measure stitch patterns. If it were a cable, and you let's say this was 20 stitches wide from here to here, you would measure it, and that's how many stitches you're getting per inch for this particular cable. Not for every cable, but for this particular cable, okay? So let's see, we probably have some more questions here. G. Fixler, do you have a system for organizing and referencing all your swatches? I put, um, you notice some of them have um, tags on them. I put, use the tags and I just put them in shoe boxes. <laughs> That's my system, okay? I kind of like digging through them. It's kind of fun, um, but I have a lot of them. This is a small amount of my swatches. Okay. Yeah, I could sew these swatches together to make a blanket. This wristlet is really cute. Where'd it go? Yes, it would be cute on a sleeve, you know. So let's say you're doing your yoke pattern. You could put this design around the yoke, and then you could put it around the sleeve. Wouldn't that be cute? That'd be adorable. You could put two of them around the yoke, one here and one here, and then one around the sleeve. Super cute. Okay, Charles. Yes, I put a row or yarn overs in my swatches to remind me of the needle size. Yes, what I do, and there's any number of ways, I put purl stitches in for the needle size. Um, yarn overs work, but yarn overs increase the width of your swatch right there. So I just put um, those, or you can tie a knot into the tail you know, one knot for each number of the needle. But if you're gonna use like this, when I started out with a smaller needle down here and I really didn't like the fabric right away, so I knew and I needed to go up. So then I went up a needle size. You can see how the swatch got wider there at the top. Okay. And Natalie asked how I store my swatches in, in shoe, big shoe boxes, like the kind you put boots in, works really good. Oh, let's see. Scott says, question, if I'm knitting tessellated cables, are there any special things to do to compensate flare working up a sweater design? If it's going to be an all over pattern with the tessellated cables, I would just measure a big swatch. Yeah, I would do it on a swatch, not little individual cables. 
Patricia Merrick, will you be including any suggested designs or for stranded? I was thinking of uh, having quite a few different designs that I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest some in lace that'll work out really good for you. Cables, stranded, some mosaic knitting. Each one of the things I talked about, I'm going to give you some um, suggestions, okay? Mary Inman, questions. In Principles of Knitting, June Hemans Hyatt mentions knitting two inch test swatch before knitting gauge swatch. Is that a valid idea? You could. I have a book here. Let me see if I can find it. Hmm. It's called The Raveled Sleeve, and Charles has this book too. It's by um, Catherine Lowe. And I might not be able to find it right off the top of my head. Oh, here it is. The Raveled Sleeve. You have to order it from her website. I don't think you can buy it from Amazon. But let me tell you how many pages she has devoted in here to a gauge swatch. So... She has in Essentials 2, Swatching and Blocking Part 1 and Swatching and Blocking Part 2, and they go from page 33 to page 87, and that's just on gauge swatches. So um, that's how important she thinks gauge swatches are. She swatches before she makes a gauge swatch. And I don't necessarily agree with that, but I, I do make really big swatches and I swatch a lot, but the things I make come out to my satisfaction. I like them. Okay. Do you want to see that one again? It's called the Raveled, R-A-V-E-L-L apostrophe D sleeve by Catherine Lowe. And just about... Um, her opinions about knitting and, and finessing your knitting. She's a couture knitter. Her stuff is awesome. She has some great buttonholes. Uh, her seaming ideas are very, very interesting. I like some of them. And as Charles said, her swatches are 10 inches square. Um, and she makes multiples of those. So, um, And she knits mostly in stockinette stitch. Okay. Lourdes Padilla says, wants to know where my classes are held. They're held in Bakersfield, California. But this is the deal. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the summer off from teaching classes because I'm going to take my boot camp one and my boot camp two, and I'm going to beef them up. And I'm thinking of uh, making them available to people to just purchase as a intact course. So it would have all the materials that you need, including yarn, needles, all your elements for be beginning knitting. And this is not for beginner knitters. It's for people that want to finesse their knittings. But I start at the ground and I work up. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many aha moments that you will have, even if you've been knitting for 30 years. And I'm going to market them. Um, my local yarn store, Ron, at the yarn store, he's going to make the kits with the supplies. And I, I will have the handout plus all the videos, plus there's going to be some uh, videos that are only available to those class participants that are more like classroom videos. And it'll be a standalone program that you can purchase and learn how to knit. So um, I'm, I'm planning on working on that all summer. So that's kind of the direction I'm going in that. Nancy Reese. Question, could you make a video on joining Brioche in the Round, also how to fix mistakes? And I have quite a few videos on Brioche, on fixing mistakes. I have some on um, joining in the round, starting and working Brioche in the Round, and in one color and two color. Um, I don't know if I have, hmm, you'll have to look at those. I have quite a few Brioche videos. I have a playlist called Brioche. You can go back and look at that and I'll link it down in the information tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Pilar K. I would like to know why buying needles from Amazon is not recommended because I have seen a number of people get needles from Amazon that are aged. The cables are stiff. 
the needles have been in storage for too long. And I don't know whether they are direct from the manufacturer or someone is reselling them. But I have seen in person people who have gone to Amazon because the prices are so good and bought their cable needles, not straight needles, but the cable needles from Amazon. And the cables are like this permanent coil and you can't get them out. Okay. Claudia Bueno says in Europe, Haya Haya has an Amazon store. That Okay, so that's great. But in the United States, if you go on to Amazon and get Haya Haya, you're going to get secondhand needles. Okay. So any other questions? We're doing really good. Let me see if I shared everything I wanted to share. It looks like it. So I want to tell you, for those that are hanging in here till the end, um, Charles and I are redoing our interview video this Wednesday. I think you'll like it a lot better. I won't be interrupting him, I promise. He has a lot to say, and I want to hear what he has to say. But I couldn't hear him. The timing was off, and it was totally my fault. I made a really stupid mistake right in the beginning, and I couldn't see it until it was over. But I know not to do that. So um, tune in on Wednesday at 12 o'clock Pacific time with Charles again. And then once we get that and it's going good and everything, then we'll have Arenda on in a couple of weeks. So I've got to coordinate that with her, Arenda Holiday. She's the CEO of the Knitting Guild Association. And I think you'll love her too. But Charles has a lot to say that um, I think you'll really like and you'll want to come back and listen to that again. And once we redo that, live stream, I'm going to lock the other one so that people can't go back. We'll, we'll talk about the same things. We're going to answer the same questions. It'll just have a much nicer flow. I want it to be a conversation between Charles and I rather than cut to Charles, cut to me, cut to Charles, cut to me. And I've done a ton of research more on using Google Hangouts and whether I can get a split screen. It does not look like it's possible to do it in Google Hangouts. You can do it on Facebook, but I'm not interested in making videos on Facebook. I'm interested in making my videos on YouTube. So um, that's what we're going to be doing. It'll be cutting back and forth, but we'll be able to have an ongoing conversation, like a normal conversation. That's what I really would like to do, and I think that you'll really like that. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Yes, I think seeing Charles again will be fun. Hello from Scotland. Hi. <laughs> Charles says they may not want to hear more from me. Yes, they do, Charles. They loved you. So it's going to be fun. Yes, Valerie Dunham says, I love this. Thank you, Valerie. She says, consider your first interview with Charles as an enjoyable swatching experience before knitting the final product. Thank you. Exactly. We were swatching. Okay. Also, um, Oh, Charles, did you hear that? Did you see that? David wants you to show more of your socks next time and bring some more of your sweaters. You know, you have some gorgeous sweaters. And of course, everybody wants to hear more about the sweater that you were wearing too. They, I got a lot of positive feedback about that. Okay, is that good? Are we good for today? Thumbs up. And be sure to share my videos. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. When I go back and look at the statistics on these, about 25% of you are subscribed to my YouTube channel and the other 75% aren't. So go ahead and subscribe. YouTube puts a big weight on the number of subscribers. They value you as a, um, a videographer by how many subscribers you have on your channel. So to them, that's the most important thing. Okay. I will list the books in the bottom. Yes. Okay. We'll see you next time on Wednesday at noon with noon Pacific time with Charles. Have a good day.